Good with the uh, Gina Lunch Seminar for today. Uh, so our speaker today is George Kirkakis. So probably well known to most people in this room. Uh, and so George is going to talk to us about uncertainties in statistical model calculations. Uh, George got his PhD at the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, and then spent a number of years here at the NSCL as a postdoc and scientist, and then moved to Central Michigan University, where he's just become an associate professor. So welcome, George, and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about this uh, project uh, that uh, bothers me for, for several years now. Um, about the uncertainties that our theory um, calculations uh, impose on all the neutron capture rays that we need to do um, astrophysics uh, calculations. Uh, this is work that has been done in collaboration with people at Notre Dame and Los Alamos, and I was also some recent published work uh, in collaboration with the Nucrid people. Um, this work is obviously uh, motivated by the puzzle of uh, the nucleosynthesis puzzle. We would like to know um, how these elements that we see in the, in the solar system composition came to be. And we are in a pretty good, pretty good times because we have a lot of observation and we can compare these uh, abundances uh, that you see here with the, with the blue line to spectra from uh, metal pool stars in, in this case, for instance. And we would like to take advantage of all these observations. I mean, we even, we even have gravitation waves uh, that told us that the uh, neutron stars are merging and are producing our process elements. So somehow we need to take all these, all these uh, observations and be able to, um, to compare them uh, with what we can produce in the laboratory and see if we can explain them with theory. So I took this quote, I think this is, I was thinking for a long time, this is probably the most quoted phrase in all introductions of, uh, of uh, heavy element nucleosynthesis papers. There's some kind of most or almost all, or more than half of the elements above iron are made by neutron capsule process, or you can put our process depending on what you, you're talking about exactly. So it, it's too bad though, because we need to, to talk about neutron capsule processes. And that means that we need to have neutron capsule rates. And this is a little bit problematic because uh, Let's say, for instance, in, in, in an R process nucleosynthesis, I, I took this from Mum Power's uh, review paper, uh, where he's uh, showing the uh, different, different stages of nucleosynthesis in an R process scenario. And you see here we have the stable nuclei. And actually, these are the only nuclei that we actually have reliable experimental neutron capture rates. But the nucleosynthesis is going very far away. And, you know, at late stages, it comes closer to. To stability but still we have to deal with all these neutron capsule reaction rates for these unstable nuclei and the problem with that is okay we have radioactive beams and we can uh, we can generate radioactive beams and we would like to be able to do neutron capsule reactions but we still don't have the technology the target is a bit elusive and we cannot really uh, we cannot really build a neutron target so what do we do? We have to acknowledge that there are very interesting and, and, and groundbreaking uh, um, experimental techniques out of this need. We have the surrogate reactions, uh, using deuterium-induced reactions, for instance, to, um, to, to try to find an equivalent of a neutron capture. We have here developed the beta Oslo technique. And, and you know this, uh, these two people. And this is uh, also a, a very exciting opportunity. Still though, these techniques will depend a little bit on, on theory and uh, either to interpret the data or to understand the reaction mechanism. Uh, for instance, if I take my, my favorite of the techniques, uh, so we see here that uh, we have, uh, in this beta also technique, we can populate a compound nucleus with um, a beta decay and generate um, basically plots of the level densities as a function of excitation energy or gamma ray setting functions. And I will talk a little bit about what these things are in, in more detail. Um, the impressive thing is that we have a big uncertainty, which is shown here with the, with the lighter band. 
And then after we do the measurement, this, this uncertainty in the reaction rate can be reduced a lot. But you see still this, this dark blue band um, carries some uncertainty. And if you look at these uh, experimental points here, these continuous lines are all the complete levels that we have for the, uh, for the compound nucleus in question. The points here are the ones from the beta oslo technique. And some of these points have some normalization that depends on some theory. And still this is compared with some uh, hartree bogolyubov uh, technique. So in the end, you end up with this uncertainty band. In this case, it's particularly good, but we need to really understand how this, uh, how this uncertainty will work out in, in neutron rich scenario. So still we will need to have some, some good theory to be able to take advantage of this, of this amazing picture. Now the question that uh, we normally ask is, uh, okay, how much of an uncertainty is a good uncertainty or how much is a bad one? And uh, this comes uh, from uh, Sean Liddick's uh, paper about the beta oslo technique. And I think it's based on a calculation by Manpower in, in, uh, in this progress in particle and nuclear physics uh, paper, where you see with the experimental points, the um, R process uh, abundances uh, observed. And with the different shades of green, we see um, calculations, Monte Carlo calculations with the hauser firstbach model in which um, the reaction rates have been randomly uh, varied by factors of 100 in the lightest uh, shaded area down to a factor or two with the darkest. And looking at that, you would think that probably I need something between a factor of two and a factor of 10 uncertainty to be able to, to compare effectively these experimental, uh, these observations with uh, the yields of my calculations. So before I can calculate an uncertainty, I have to understand what, what kind of uncertainties are going into, into these models. So one kind of uncertainty that I will call statistical is how precise or how well constrained is a calculation. So if I take one of the parameters, how well defined is this parameter? Can it vary a little bit? Uh, and if I vary that, how much does it uh, change uh, my calculation? And this, uh, this has been done in the past, and I have an example here by Bertoli from uh, Los Alamos, where he did this Monte Carlo and found all the correlations about the parameters. A second uncertainty <clears throat> that we have to take into account is that if, if we take different implementation of the same model, so the Hausdorff-Hersbach theory is uh, well known, but people historically have implemented it in different ways. So Mary Beard, uh, four years ago, did a, a very detailed study of how these uh, implement implementations affect the model uh, results. And um, she found some interesting results in, in this paper. Both these uh, two uncertainties though, when we go far away from stability, are much smaller than the elephant in the room, which is a systematic uncertainty, which affects our extrapolation. So are we actually using the correct models when we go away from stability? And let's say that uh, I, have a, I have a model that predicts reaction rates, but this is not constrained by any experiment like we do uh, near stability. How well does this model do? And this is a very large uncertainty as I will show, and it's not very well defined because, I mean, I don't really know if the, if the model is appropriate and I don't know if I, if I have, uh, are all my models equally appropriate? And, have I scanned all the possible models or have I, am I spanning the whole distribution if I want to think in terms of an uncertainty? Usually what we do, we just take different models and, and uh, vary them and see how much they, they differ. So before, before I go further, I should talk a little bit about the statistical model and how we see a nuclear reaction in this model. So typically we assume that we have a target nucleus that captures a particle. In our case, that would be a neutron. And then a compound system is created that is at a very highly excited uh, state where many levels exist. The, the creation of this, of this state is completely separate from the decay. 
and the decay can follow different paths, either by emitting gamma rays or emitting particles to create a new nucleus or emitting that same neutron uh, or another neutron and going back to the, to the target nucleus. And the cross-section for this process is typically proportional to the transmission coefficients for emitting these, these particles or these gamma rays. So these transmission coefficients are basically depending on, on particle widths. And um, the competition between these channels defines the cross-section. So we have here in the denominator the sum of all the possible ways that this excited system could decay. And on the numerator, we have the transmission coefficient to create that compound system and the transmission coefficient for a gamma decay in the case of n-gamma. Now, in the cases that we're interested in, in astrophysics, usually the, the picture is very simple. So we don't have really competition from particle channels when we do um, neutron captures, let's say, in the R process. We basically, the biggest channel is uh, emission of a neutron doing an N prime back and then uh, gamma decay. So this transmission coefficient is much larger than this little one. And basically this whole denominator is dominated by the neutron channel. So that's why this, this gamma decay will be very, very important if, if you want to, to describe neutron capture. <clears throat> the second concept that is very important for, for uh, this statistical model theory is, uh, is the continuum. So we assume that the reactions are taking uh, at sufficiently high excitation energy that all this resonance that we would normally see are starting to overlap with each other. And then at some point, it makes sense to talk about an average cross-section. And, and in this case, instead of going and counting widths of individual uh, levels, we have to talk about the level density and then integrate over, this, over these widths. So basically, a transmission coefficient will depend on the widths for the particle emission if we have a particle channel it will depend on the width for emitting a gamma ray, and we, we parameterize that in terms of a gamma strength. But this is not the whole story. So there's a, a whole series of parameters and small details that depend on the implementation that go into these models. Now, for our case, the most important thing would be the level density, the gamma ray strengths, for the reason I, I described earlier about the competition between the neutron channel, the gamma channel. So the optical potential will not play such a big role. Discrete level information, well, if you're very far away from stability, good luck. There are, there are ways in the models uh, to, to interpolate with theory and uh, assume some levels, but as you understand, this is a problem. The, the complete level schemes get exhausted very fast and they don't exist if you are uh, quite far away. There are smaller things like energy binning that can destroy calculation in majestic ways. Um, there are things like shell corrections that basically depend on the mass differences uh, and, and pairing, separation energies, obviously, and so on. So there's a big list, but I will focus mostly on these two. So the approach we took in, in, in this work um, started uh, again with uh, this work by uh, Lydic and collaborators. So at this time we're doing hazard first calculations um, uh, for neutron rich nuclei. And what we did is we took several level density models that are available in TALIS. These are not all the models that TALIS contains. We, we had to eliminate some because they were producing some uh, um, spurious results and some unphysical or even effects. But we took three phenomenological uh, level densities that are typically used and two semi-microscopic level densities. And we varied those. And then for the gamma ray strength functions, we use the kopetsky uh, lorentzian which uh, is properly parameterized to reproduce uh, experimentally observed strength and a modified Lorentzian, which are the two phenomenological models of gamma strength we used. And again, two Hartree-Fock approaches by the uh, authors of Thales. So we varied all this, uh, we did all the possible combination of, this, of these models, and then we gave to Sean and his collaborators a table which 
gives um, an idea of what the variation of our, in our results is um, as a function of n and z, basically. And the color coding here is in factors. So green color is a factor of five between the lowest and the highest calculation. Um, you know, yellow is five to 10, um, darker yellow 10 to 20, 20 to 100, and so on. And you see that quite quickly you go to large, large ascendancies. So we, we reach that uh, not so nice uh, band of a factor of 10, um, even for, this, uh, for these systems. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, application that actually was recently published is uh, using these uh, reaction rates for a, a, an eye process type of nucleosynthesis. And I will not go into extreme detail in, into this, but uh, eye process is very interesting for um, uh, stars that carbon, carbon oxygen uh, and has have this uh, thin helium shell. And this is typically post-AGB stars, but People have used it also for carbon enhanced RS stars and also for uh, rapidly accreting white dwarfs. And in the literature, they've used, the, the eye process has been invoked to, to, to resolve sev several other discrepancies. In, in this case, what we did in this uh, work that was just accepted in uh, uh, General Physics G, um, Pavel Denisenko gave us a, a network of uh, nuclei and we did the same work where we found how, many, how much the rates were varying, and the color coding here is a bit different, it's 5, 10, 20, and 30. Then uh, Pavel took these rates and put them in a, in a Monte Carlo code, and then he was able to compare um, the observations from Sakurai's object, which is uh, um, the typical environment for, for the eye process, and you can see uh, this is given with this, um, uh, round uh, points and compare them with the results of the Monte Carlo, which are this, uh, this uh, color coded uh, lines. So you can imagine these color coded lines as a Gaussian. So the peak is somewhere here, and you see this uh, square with an arrow bar showing the uh, standard deviation. So this is the kind of, of work that one could do and use this kind of uh, reaction rates um, to get something useful. No, of course, uh, if you read this paper, you'll see there's some arguments about, um, you know, what constraints that this impose into the, into the astrophysical environment, and so on. Yes, yeah, so on top of this, so in this paper, on top of this uh, uh, distribution, uh, the center of the distribution is uh, denoted with a square, and this uh, error bar is the standard, the, the, the standard deviation. So basically, this is simulation, this is observation. Yes, the circle is the actual observation, and the square is just uh, to help see the centroid of the Monte Carlo and the, uh, the, the sigma. Yes, it's a, it's a big, uh, it's a, yes, okay. All right, so we did the same uh, kind of thing for um, most neutron rich nuclei and uh, with, uh, with collaborators from Redam and Los Alamos and students from Central Michigan, we have generated now a table of these variations for, for many neutron rich nuclei that could be uh, used in, in, let's say, our process uh, nucleosynthesis. Yes, that is a log scale. Thank you for the question. This is a log scale, and two means factor of two, so 100. So this is a log of the, of the variation. Yes, you're right. So dark red is a factor of two or more. Uh, green is a factor of 10, basically. And very quickly, you get. No, this does not. So to be consistent, these all were done with the same uh, mass model. So in this case, we use the FRDM. Then uh, Rebecca and Matt took this and, and did again a Monte Carlo, uh, varying the reaction rates and comparing with uh, some typical R, R process scenarios. So this one is an example for a neutrino-driven wind. 
the, the pink area is the result from the Monte Carlo with Thales, and the experimental points are the, uh, the abundances. And for comparison, we have some calculations with uh, non-smoker COH, which is uh, Los Alamos uh, House of Feshbach code, and CIGAR, which was a code that was developed at uh, Notre Dame. And you see where these uh, models lie. Now, these lines don't have any variations of the ingredients, but are here to show you um, the differences. And one thing that I want to point out to you is that this Monte Carlo makes large variations, and you see these very pronounced or even effects here when you start uh, changing this, uh, these reaction rates. This is a more uh, perhaps interesting example of a neutron star merger. And again, you see how these variations, you know, if you accept that this is the uncertainty, this makes it difficult to compare. That's all I'm going to say. So it's, it's important to understand why, why is this happening. And right now, so far, we're using it as a black box. We're doing these variations, and we see all these, uh, all these rates changing. But what is the explanation? Where does this come from? So that's what, what I was interested, what we were interested in. And um, we started, uh, I mean, with uh, this calculation. And one example that came to mind was, OK, we go to this, uh, this sensitivity study, and we pick one of the darker green uh, nuclei, which is 165 europium, and see what would I get if I, had, uh, if I, if I looked at the reaction rate of that, uh, of that particular uh, neutron capture. So here you see the reaction rate for N gamma on 165 europium as a function of temperature. And the, and the band here is the variation of the reaction rates. Now, at temperatures about, uh, you know, one giga Kelvin, this is about a factor of 10. And, you know, it goes uh, higher and then blows up at much larger temperatures. Probably we care mostly for this region if we're doing our process. Um, but, okay, what does this mean? Where does this come from? So the next step was to look at the level density of the compound nucleus. So we, we take the reaction neutron plus 165 europium and we look at the nuclear level density and how it is predicted by different models as a function of excitation energy. So for reference, this, is the, this line is roughly the 1.5 giga Kelvin in this particular calculation. And we see some interesting grouping here. The three, the, the three lines here are the three phenomenological models that we used in the, in the code. And these two lines are the two uh, semi-microscopic models. And you see that as we go up in excitation energy, this, this difference is, is increasing. Then uh, similar results we see for the gamma ray strength. So, Again, here we have gamma ray strength as a function of gamma ray energy. 1.5 giga Kelvin will be somewhere here. And the, these two top lines are microscopic models. These two bottom lines are the phenomenological models. So in both cases, we see some grouping. And this is, a, this is something that is a bit disturbing. I, I don't, uh, we have to understand why this is so. Is this real? Either the phenomenological models are uh, dumb and, and don't have uh, any predictive power or uh, and or these ones have some problem or both i don't know but uh, this is interesting and i don't know what would happen if we have another model i mean you had a, a more sophisticated model where would that be in here so we can then propagate this and and you know see what happens if we do an only microscopic calculation we'll use only the microscopic ingredients and uh, this is the, the lighter band that you see here. Or what happens if I get the phenomenological only ingredients and I get this darker band? Okay, still this is interesting information, but maybe it does not, uh, it does not say much. Another more, uh, more uh, uh, another better insight into what these calculations do is if we take um, isotopic chains and try to do the same thing. So this is for europium isotopes at one giga Kelvin. On the horizontal axis, we have um, mass number. On the vertical axis, we have reaction rate. 
And here we see another interesting effect. First of all, we see these very pronounced or even effects, which we saw also on the Monte Carlo calculation. And you see that this, this odd even effect seems to be mostly happening because of the microscopic models. Well, if you take the, the phenomenological models, you don't have this so much. I mean, maybe here, but not there. So I think this is something we need to understand, and this is the, the process we are at. But Well, typically phenomenological models, uh, in this case, are thermodynamic models. And they have a solid theoretical uh, background, but they're not microscopic in the sense that you assume a temperature, let's say if you're using a constant temperature model, um, you know, you assume that you have a Fermi distribution and this is tuned to experiment. So when these models were developed, the problem was how do we uh, calculate properly a cross section and we have the data to, in the adjoining areas to do it, to do the, the normalization. The microscopic models are also not completely microscopic. They are Hartree-Fock uh, based uh, um, um, solutions, but then they are, overly, oh, they have an overall normalization based on the existing data. So they are semi-microscopic. So we, we can again see the, uh, break it down to, and look at the devil densities as a function of this uh, mass number. And here we don't see anything particularly too different between the two models, apart from the fact that some of the, of the microscopic models seem to be having a very large uh, variation of the level density for some isotopes. So they go from, you know, from one isotope to the next, you go from a level density of, uh, you know, a few thousand levels per MeV to 10. And it's not clear if this is uh, very natural. We do the same for the, for the gamma strengths. And here we, we just see basically again the grouping that the, the microscopic models are here on the top and the, the phenomenological on the bottom. And in this case, probably there's not much to say apart from the fact that again we have this deep and probably we can explain. Looking at, this, at these two curves, we can probably, if we imagine that this, this two things are multiplied, we can more or less understand this whole range of calculations. Right. Yeah, well, stable europium is this way. So there's no neutron capture data for, for europium nuclei. So, and you see that as you start close to stability, this seem to be agreeing, but then as you start moving away, these start to differ a lot. And sometimes they have, you see a big jump. Exactly. Yes. Ah, this is a, a bin uh, as close as possible to the cutoff of one giga Kelvin. So looking at the highest energy uh, that I can reach at to one giga Kelvin, uh, I pick a bin in the continuum and I take this level density. So it's only at that bin. Uh, right, exactly, yes. Well the, level, well, the level density enters the, um, the average level density enters also the, the gamma width. So, um, so at, at lower ends than one giga Kelvin? Um, no, it's, a, it's at, uh, 
yes, it's at one giga Kelvin. Uh, it's what would be the energy of the of the neutrons at one giga Kelvin of of temperature. So, the, so this this binning comes from you know Rauscher et al. table. And you decay from there. Yes, right. I see what you mean. Um, Everything up to the energy right. So implicitly, this uh, will enter in the gamma ray strength because when you when you do the gamma ray strength, you implicitly uh, put there also the average level density. So in the next plot, you have that information. But true, you you would like to look at the ending point of the of the gamma decay. The interesting part, though, is that the way we model uh, gamma, gamma decays, we model them as the inverse of an absorption. So basically, uh, in, uh, in statistical models, we always assume that we start from, a, from a one state and we go to many. And therefore, whenever you do a gamma decay, you're actually using the level density of the income of the of the start point and not of the end. So you hit a very interesting point in what you're saying because because the, the, the gamma decay has been modeled in photoabsorption, we have a formalism that actually takes into account in the decay the entry state of the of the gamma decay and not the end point. But in uh, in reality, you would think that uh, the correct way to do it would be to pick one of these one of these beams here and calculate the gamma decay to a level, but this is not what the codes do currently. This is a, a very, excuse me? No, the energy is the same, but basically what they do is they, they invert this problem and they never have the, in, in the gamma strength only, you see that you never have the gamma density of the ending, uh, of the ending point, you have the gamma, uh, the, the level density of the entry level. This is very weird, isn't it? Well, uh, you you integrate afterwards, so on average this should be fine. Yeah, you still do some integration here, but uh, or here. I mean, uh, you use all of them in the end, but in the co but that's what goes into your um, explicitly in your code. So then uh, basically that goes into your transmission coefficient. So this is a very subtle point and yes, it's, it's interesting. Okay, I think I've been particularly bad at repeating the, the question for the recording, but okay. So, <clears throat> all right, yes, we saw that. Another interesting case is, is uh, about gallium isotopes. And I want to show you that because here you see again the same trend where, okay, you have this uh, odd even effect. You see the hauser feshbach theories kind of agree, but then at some point you have these very big differences and very big distance between the theoretical and the microscopic models. And these stats are about 84 and huge odd even effects in these cases, but okay. So here, if we look at the gamma ray strength, we see that suddenly the phenomenological distribution and the microscopic distribution differ a lot. So suddenly you have this, this jump. And when I first saw that, I, I thought, oh, how is this possible? And at first, I, 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 we thought that uh, the reason for this thing is that at some point, we don't have any more uh, experimental levels. And then the code is doing something funny. But it turned out that this was not the case. It turns out that uh, the actual model that um, this, this Hartree Fock plus QRPA model that uh, um, Gorielli is using in this particular case is actually including some strength. So as you go from A equals 81 to A equals 85, this model suddenly comes up with some strength. There must be some microscopic reason for this to be happening. I'm not, I'm not really a theorist and I, I don't know if this is uh, reasonable, 
but in the range parenthesis is here and this little tail that this uh, these things put in there enhances the gamma ray strength in the region we're interested so then you have the, the phenomenological models down here and the other models up there and this creates this huge weird uh, change so now this is the conundrum right is this a prediction or is this uh, something problematic with the model For completeness, I show also the level densities with different uh, with different uh, models. This light green one is again a, a microscopic one. The red one is also microscopic. I'm just showing this to to show that more or less, if you, if you pay if, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that this structure, when it gets folded with this structure, more or less explains the shape. But clearly, something is going on when we use these microscopic models and this is mostly happening because of this gamma ray strength so this is uh, where um, we are at i think the basic thing is that we cannot use hauser fresbach as a black box we should be paying attention to what we are using and what happens there on the other hand we need some sophisticated uncertainty estimate for reaction rates away from stability and one approach is what we're doing right now but I don't see how this can take us too far away if we don't have a new microscopic theory or improved microscopic theory maybe we can use shell model which will have interactions away from stability and find some way to to make up from the fact that we cannot uh, actually use it for so many for, such, for so large spaces and, and create some level density models and we definitely need to, to work more on these beta Oslo and uh, surrogate techniques to get some constraints on the theory, even if there is some small uh, theoretical uh, bias there. And in the future, and in the EFRIB era, I think it's very critical to get some reaction theory support for these experimental techniques. So that's all I had. Thank you very much. No, uh, I mean, we have seen that uh, even when using the other uh, models, you get uh, similar uh, huge variations. The reason this is not a, a terrible problem is because of the, we that the, the way that we create the nucleus and the way it decays is somehow independent. And then the whole problem is somehow scaled to the energy range uh, in question. So we always have a, a, a separation energy that defines the excitation energy and then um, everything is uh, scaled in, in that way. So I've not seen uh, a particular change in the picture by just uh, going from one mass model to the other. And actually in the typical um, uh, calculations uh, in TALIS, it, it mixes uh, theory and models because it uses you know, experimental values up to one point then it uses some uh, model and so on but always I say the microscopic model is based on this um, HFB so I think this has not been a significant problem uh, at least not to the re to the level that uh, we are talking here sure it would be very good if we could uh, do um, everything very consistently and in some cases it might be important to increase uh, precision
Right, right, right. In, in principle, yes, and, and you could um, you could do, but then will you always have a model that, so how do you do it when you don't have the microscopic model? So you could still use that mass model, of course. So you, you could always have some mixing there. Um, I agree, it would be very interesting to, to see very consistently how this uh, would work out, but I, I sense that probably it would be more important for uh, things that your matter, that precision matters more than accuracy, that's what we have here. Right, yeah. Yes, you can imagine what will happen, yeah. Right, you're absolutely right. And uh, um, it is, uh, it, it's for sure that you will have this enormous enhancement. Uh, actually, in the literature, the people have, have tried this and, and even from, uh, so uh, Alex, I think, Alex Brown and uh, the Oslo people had some calculations uh, with uh, uh, where they, uh, they had some, uh, they produced uh, some, uh, they, they had data from the Oslo method where they saw this uh, increased uh, low energy strength and they were able to do also some calculations to show that this uh, would, uh, would provide uh, an enhancement. I mean, for sure, if you, if you increase the tail, Right, um, yes, it's not clear how to put that pygmy resonance in there though, and how to extrapolate far away from stability. You're exactly right. So there is some strength there, there's some M1 strength that you can put that is uh, uh, depending on the, um, on the U1 in some way, but there's no good recipe to actually add to all of these pygmy resonances. Who? It's another thing, yes. Right, so this is an, so this probably is related also to what Samuel asked. So ideally you would like to have cell corrections that are uh, not based on a recipe. So in, in many of these models, particularly in the back shifted Fermi gas model, um, it's based on some phenomenological corrections and there's a factor that depends on whether you have even even or even odd or uh, nucleus. So there's a, a shift of basically your, all your energy scale based on that. And ideally, you would like to be able to have uh, maybe a theory that tells you where is this, um, uh, where the mass, uh, the mass surface changes, and um, that would be nice to have. And of course, if you have data from, um, from away from stability, one could think about putting it there and comparing. I think though the problem is that it's very hard to get experimental data for all these things. So I really think we have to have some theory that can, can reproduce that. Um, you're talking about uh, away from stability, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand that they may be hard, but at least they are even more much harder away than the But uh, so, how would you do it though for a different? Yeah, or like a proton yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Perhaps, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the experiments that have done that, but uh, in principle, one would think that you could do it. So um, there have been studies of where, uh, what is the extent that you can assume the statistical, and where is the statistical threshold? And um, close to, uh, near close shells, you have to be careful that you don't go into the, um, into the uh, discrete, basically. Um, also, people have seen that the averaging still is not, producing you know factors of 10 or 100 in these regions but sure you have to be careful in in some in some regions and um Rauscher has done a, an extensive study of, of where you can apply it um regarding isospin um these models don't have explicitly isospin uh, uh, in there i think uh, the ohio group has tried um, uh, to modify uh, the hauser fesbach uh, model to include isospin explicitly. Um, it is a correction. I'm not sure it is um, to the extent of orders of magnitude still. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly, yes, nice is a good indicator because you, you can correlate with uh, going away from stability. And if you look at this calculation, you see that there's no clear correlation with isospin in these models. I mean, we've, we've done this exercise, but yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.